this morning, I fought with God for the whole week on this message. It's the third part of a, a mini series on one verse that we find in Luke chapter 9. And uh, Luke chapter 9 uh, has that verse in there. It says, basically, the fact if we deny ourselves and take up our cross, we can follow Christ. And the words follow me, I mean, there's so many references in God's word about following him. But it got me really thinking about what does it mean to follow me? Real basic words, but what does it mean? And I, I know this, that when you play a game, you play to what? Remember Herm Edwards? We play to win the game, right? If anybody remembers him back in the day, Herm Edwards, uh, Kansas City chief coach at the time, uh, talked about defining what a win is. And a win is winning the game, all right? Uh, how you win the game, you know, there's different ways that you can go about that, different strategies, different things that you can do. But the def definition of a win is we win and play for the win. We define a win and then we play for the win. We define it first, what is a win, and then we play for it. So how in church, what is a win for Faith Baptist Church? Well, it's out in our lobby. The win is making more and better disciples of Christ. That's it. That's the win. If we make more disciples, we win. If we make better disciples, we win. So when we win, we win by making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. That's a win for our church. Now, how do we do that? Well, there's six pillars, if you will, of ministry that help us to do that. And they're out there on the wall too. Found people do what? If you've been lost in the woods, do you know who volunteers more than any other type of volunteer to find lost people? People who have been lost themselves. So if you were to go out in a search and rescue team and you were to interview them, most of the volunteers that will help out in a search and rescue mission have also themselves once been, that's why they're passionate about finding people. So lost people or found people find people. Those who have been lost find people who are currently lost. Save people, serve people. If you're saved, then you understand that church is no longer about what you get out of it. It's 100% about what you put into it. And if you're in a consumer mindset, then you hate, you hate going to church. Church is a waste of time. Church is just something we do and we're checking a box and you're not, you're not seeing what God wants you to see in the church. You're going through the motions. You're spiritually dry and you're struggling in your spiritual walk. You say, how can you say those things dogmatically? Because I'm not saying them. That's what God's word says. So save people, serve people. The reason that we exist is Christ. Why did God not kill you and take you to heaven the second you prayed the prayer or believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and you were saved? Why did God not just immediately take you home? Because he expects you to serve. That's the expectation in God's word. It's not about what we get from Christ. Who's the greatest leader in the kingdom? Let him be your servant. Those that serve, they're the greatest in the kingdom of God. Number three, growing people change. <laughs> I am so glad I didn't see any of you pull your bottles out yet this morning and start drinking from your bottle. You know why? You change. Your appetite grows. You change physically. You change emotionally. You change in so many ways. You know what? I, I hear people all the time, well, I just don't like change. But I don't see anybody carrying a bag phone. I don't see anybody driving a 1970s anything. And if they do, they put a collector plate on it and brag about it. It's not that they have to drive that. It's not that they refuse to change. They like change. We all like change. How many of you have upgraded your cell phone in the last three years? See, you like change. It's just a fact. Growing things change. You can't outgive God, be the church, and life is better connected. These are all ways that we, as a church, get the wins for making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. These things are going to help us with our focus. It's going to help us with our drive. It's going to help us with our methodology. It's going to help us with our theology. It's going to help us make more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 15. 
1 Corinthians 15 this morning. And as we go there, I'm going to do some responsive reading with you. I'm going to read the first slide, and then you can read the second slide, and we'll kind of go through it responsively here. But I asked you a minute ago, why do you do what you do? I asked the men in Sunday school class to define this too. Why do you do what you do? And there's a real simple thing. Why do we go to church? Why are you here this morning? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you share your faith with other people? Why do you teach a Sunday school class? Why do you usher? Why are some people a deacon? Why, why do we do what we do? Okay? This passage of scripture tells us exactly why every Christian should do what they are called to do. What we're supposed to do it for. Let's read it together. You go ahead and start. Now of Christ... And it says this, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then let's read the rest together. Your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. You know why we do what we do as Christians? Because of the resurrection. If it wasn't for the resurrection, if it wasn't for the death, the burial, and the resurrection, you wouldn't even be a Christian today. If it wasn't for the resurrection, Jesus was just every other guy. If it wasn't for the resurrection, you have no conquering in your faith. If it wasn't for the resurrection, you have no forgiveness of sin. If it wasn't for the resurrection, you have no inheritance of heaven. If it wasn't for the resurrection, there's no purpose in even meeting today. But if Christ is raised, then every person in here has a reason to serve God. Every Christian not only has a reason, but you have a responsibility to serve God. You have a requirement to serve God. You have a, to use a modern word, mandate. My era of mandates is when guys went out together. <laughs> We didn't brag about those back then. That was not good. But if, you're, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you're still what? You're still lost. So what's the point of reading your Bible? What's the point of prayer? What's the point in going to church? I mean, I can do that from my home anyway, right? If Christ isn't resurrected, you can do whatever you want. But if Christ is resurrected and you do whatever you want, then you're going to have a major problem. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when God crashes your party. Which kind of reminds me of a video I saw. And I think this video kind of explained how some of us, um, <laughs> how some of us get in trouble in our Christian walk. What you're about to see is there's a mountain bike race that takes place in France every year. And uh, they race down a glacier on mountain bikes. Anybody, any extreme athletes in here? When you see this, this is amazing. The glacier is over 11,000 feet tall. And they start 11,000 feet and they race all the way to the base of this mountain that is covered with a glacier. And when you see it, there's almost 11,000 bikers that are registered for this race. And they're all gonna start at the top of the hill and you're gonna see them at the top of the hill. And then you're gonna see them go down into what is known as the curve of hell, okay? And if you survive the curve of hell, then you have a chance at conquering what is called the mountain of hell. And this morning I want to show you this video. So why don't you watch it and uh, see if this doesn't describe maybe where some of us end up spiritually sometimes. <laughs>
we do what we do? Poor choices. <laughs> Poor choices, huh? Why do we do what we do? How many of you guys think every rider that started at the top of that mountain thought they were going to win the race that day? They signed up because they were going to what? They were going to win. They were going to win that thing. They trained for this. They've studied the course. They knew everything. But what happened as soon as they went over the hill? Life hit, right? Life happened. Reality hit. The reality is you're riding a mountain bike down a glacier of ice trying to stop. What happens when you try to stop on ice? I felt really bad for that guy. Like, he not only went off the edge, but he like tumbled down the hill. But you know what you saw also in that video? While most of us were enthralled with the fact that all these people are wiping out, all these people are crashing, the big pileups going on, did you notice what some of the other people were doing? Some of the other people actually picked their bikes up, got back on their bike, and started riding again. How stupid are they? You know what? They're the smart ones. They could have stayed there. Do you know that the guy who won that race, the guy who won the race, passed 980 people to win? He passed, he picked his bike up and passed 980 people to win that race. He passed more people than many other people, than anybody else, really. He passed more people to win that race. Phenomenal. The guy's an extreme sport athlete and, and stuff like that. But now I want us to look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verses 8 and 9 with me. Because spiritually speaking, I know a lot of us are living in a time period in which there's a lot of spiritual wrecks going on. A lot of us are wrecking out spiritually. There's a lot of people struggling with stuff. And while you started Christianity in the, in the walk with Jesus Christ, all gung-ho, ready to go, then all of a sudden life hit. And somebody wiped out in front of you and they took you out and there's a whole big blob of carnage behind, behind us. Look at this verse. It says, we are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. Who's, who's writing this? The Apostle Paul. Did Paul know what it was like to go through bike crashes? Did he know what it was like to crash and burn and, and have to get back up and to try to keep going again? Yeah, we're afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. How many people you know living in despair today? Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I don't know about you, that, that doesn't sound like you're thriving, does it? But he is surviving. And the first key to overcoming a wreck is what? Surviving. Surviving. Then it goes on, he goes on in another passage of scripture. In case we doubted Paul's motives here, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, save one, 39 hits. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. Does that sound like a bike crash? Does that sound like a guy who's thriving spiritually? No, this sounds like a hard time. This is a tough road in his spiritual life. This is a hard time in his physical life. And Paul himself is struggling. He says on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, dangers in a city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers. I mean, where can, where can this guy go? What can he do everywhere he goes? In toil and hardship, though many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in a cold or in cold and exposure. This is, this is rough. Paul's saying, I've been there, I've, I've done that. But notice what he says next. And apart from all these things, there's the daily pressure of me, of my anxiety for all the churches. More than all the other things that happened to me, the weight that's the biggest is the church. The ministry God's called me to. That's the biggest weight that I deal with. And here Paul is defining what it means to win. He is defining what it means to win. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 
knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in what? There's that word again, isn't it? The same word earlier in 1 Corinthians 15 that says, if Christ be not risen, then your faith is in what? Vain. Here's the same word. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. What does the word steadfast mean? You guys have it. It's the right idea. Stand firm. Just stay where you are. Hold the line. Hold your place. Let me give you three things that must always be true of every Christian. Three things we must always do from this verse right here. Number one, we always need to be abounding. Where the word abounding means to overflow. It means to exceed the requirements. If God wants you to be saved, he is not satisfied with you just being saved. He wants you to abound in your salvation. What does that mean? It means do more than the minimum. Do more than what's required of you. He wants you to exceedingly, abundantly do above all that we ask or think in Christ Jesus. Always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Number two, he always wants us to be consistent. This means to be steadfast, fixed, unmovable. Hold your ground. I think of some guys in the Old Testament who are like, I don't want to get back on my bike. I'm glad being wrecked. Remember Moses? He's out in the wilderness for how many years? And God says, hey, uh, Moses, I need you to get back on your bike. And what's Moses say? No, I'm not getting back on that thing. Are you crazy, God? Do you know what they're going to do to me if I go back to Egypt? If I go back and ride that bike again? No, sir. I am not in any way, shape or form getting back on that bike. Reminded of Jonah. <laughs> Jonah, I need you to go somewhere. I need you to go to Nineveh. Did you say Spain? I heard Spain. I'm going to Tarshish. No, Jonah, you're going to Nineveh. Spain it is, God. I'm going to Spain. I am not getting on that bike. I am not getting on that bike. I have wrecked out. I'm out. I'm done. I'm not going. And we all know what happens to Jonah. He goes to Nineveh via submarine ride. Comes back around. Decides he's going to follow God's will in the end after he gets puked on the shoreline. Then the white pigment of his skin has got him so white from the acid in the fish's belly that he looks weird. So when he shows up to Nineveh, they're all like, whoa, this dude's a freak. And then he preaches and guess what happens? The enemies of God get saved. And you know what Jonah has the audacity to do? I told you, God, if I got back on that bike, I'd win. I told you I'd win if I got back on that bike. And now look, now even the enemies of God are at peace with you. See, God, it's all your fault. Really? Then there's Gideon. What's a bike, God? Define bike. I'm going to lay a fleece out, and you tell me what a bike is. And if my bike is wet, then I'll get on it. He comes out, ah, wet bike. All right, God, if the bike is dry and the ground is wet, then I'll get on the bike and ride, right? He comes out the next day, what happens? There it is. Well, I'm not really sure that you still want me to ride the bike. And we all know Gideon's story, right? So he gets 32,000 men rounded up and they're going to go to battle against the Midianites, 144,000 plus strong, 32,144. This should be an easy battle, right? We, we got this. We are outnumbered at least five to one. What happens? The sword of the Lord and Gideon, and instead of with 32,000 men, he takes what? And he surrounds them one deep. Surrounds the enemy one deep. One man deep. Can you imagine being Gideon trying to tell them, tell your, your followers what you're going to do in this battle? All right, guys, here's how it's going down. We're all going to get a pitcher. We're going to get a sword. We're going to get a trumpet. Well, actually, you don't need your sword. Forget the sword. Just trumpet and a pitcher. And, and we're going to go and we're going to surround the Midianites. And it'd be like one of the guys in the huddle like, okay, there's 300 of us. This is a couple acre complex. We can't even be shoulder to shoulder. How are we going to surround them? We're all, well, we're all going to what? This is a suicide mission, Gideon. If we do this, we're dead. We're dead men. And what was stupid in the eyes of man was what? God's will. It was already done in the eyes of God. So the Midianite, or Gideon takes, surrounds the Midianites one deep, 
They break their pitchers, shine their light, shout the sword of the Lord and Gideon, and what do the Midianites do? They kill themselves. And Gideon was able to pick up his bike and ride again. But we also see bike crashes, don't we? Remember Joshua, he crosses the River Jordan, comes to this fortified fortress called what? Jericho. Jericho is going to be, we're going to, we're going to beat this city. We're going to walk around it one time a day for six days. And on the seventh day, we're going to walk around it seven times. And we're going to put the old people up front with the, uh, with the ark. And we're going to put all the mighty men in the back. And, and this thing's going to work, man. This is going to be awesome. They go and they have this great victory at Jericho. And they're coming off this awesome victory. They rode the bike around the walls. They ride the bike to AI. And what happens in AI? Not only do they get a flat tire, but they get their bike flat stolen. They get, they get slammed. 32 men die right off the bat. Don't lose a casualty at Jericho. In the AI, we run into a bike crash. Listen to what Jeremiah, or Joshua 7 verse 10 says. The Lord said to Joshua, say the next two words. That's not how he said it. How did he say it? Get up. Right? Get up, you bum. Why have you fallen on your face? Notice he didn't say, why didn't we, why have we fallen? He says, why have you fallen, Joshua? Why'd you fall off your bike? Kind of reminds me of that first guy in the first crash. If you watch that video again, you'll see the very first guy goes over his handlebars and does a face plant on ice at 100 kilometers per hour. Now, I don't know about you, but that road rash had to hurt. I mean, the scrapes on his face afterwards... Lord said, get back on your bike, Joshua. Get on your bike. Get up. Quit quit pity partying. Quit whining in your trials. Get up. Look at the next one. Verse three, we are always going to be blessed. We're always going to be blessed. The three always of that passage of scripture there in 1 Corinthians. Your labor is not in vain if it's in what? In the Lord. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What you're doing will pay off. You may not see it, but it's not for you to see. Jonah got the opportunity to see the results of his fruit. And guess what he did with it? He despised God. He blamed God. God, see, I told you they all get saved if I preach the gospel. I wonder what would happen if we did it today. Isaiah 55, 11, look what it says here. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall be accomplished that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing which I sent it. So if God wants something to be done, who's going to stop him? So here's the question. Why did you, you come to church this morning? You know why? The reason is the resurrection. Why did you read your Bible this morning? The reason is the resurrection. Why do you share your faith with somebody else? The reason is the resurrection. Why did you take communion this morning? The reason is the resurrection. Why do you teach Sunday school, children's church, ladies Bible studies? Why do we do any of the stuff that we do as Christians or as a church? Why do we do it? Because of the resurrection. If Christ be not raised, your labor is what? It's in vain. Everything you're doing is bogus. But if Christ be raised... Then what? Then what? If Christ is raised from the dead, then then what does that mean when I don't serve him as I should? What does that mean when I don't yield to his desires and his will as I should? What happens then when we're not in alignment with God? I mean, why does the church do whatever it does? Faith promise, missions work, missions trips, all the stuff that we do as a church, why do we do it if it's not for the purpose of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? If Christ be not risen, your labor is vain. This is why you got people going to churches today and they're like, I just don't understand what God's doing in my life. Because it's not about the resurrection. It's about what they can get from God. And when we have a consumer mindset, we'll get exactly what we want, our selfish desires. And God won't be a part of our life. Because God already told us, no man can serve two masters. So he'll love the one and use the other, right? If I love myself, what am I going to do to God? 
I'm going to use them. I'm going to consume things that I want. And I'm going to do the things that I want, not the things that God wants. And I'm going to get the glory in my life. God's not going to get the glory. And what did that verse say earlier? That Jesus gets his glory, God gets his glory, and even the angels get their glory. And if I'm taking glory, then who am I robbing? There it is. So let's go back to Luke 9 now. Luke 9, 23, specifically. And he said to all. He said to who? Who's all? All means... This is good for anybody, anywhere, anytime, in any place that God created. And he said to all, if anyone, who's anyone? All, right? Anyone's anyone. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We we summarized this verse earlier this way. Salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. Salvation is free, getting to heaven is free. But if you're going to do what God has actually called you to do, to be a disciple and to make disciples, it's going to cost your life. You see, you're going to have to surrender your will to his will. You're going to have to surrender your thoughts and your desires to his thoughts and his desires. As Christ's disciples, each of us must take up our cross daily. Some of the crosses are forced on us. Others are optional. Situation in which we must choose whether or not we want to pay the price out of obedience. We can choose to suffer well and be a witness for Christ. Some are going to be persecuted as Christians. And I shared during Sunday school class uh, um, this last week, a missionary missionary friend that I had from the Kansas City area, Bob and Becky Bass. Anybody heard of them? Bob and Becky Bass. If you haven't heard this, this might might throw you back. Um, On... Friday, during the middle of the day, um, their house was broken into, where they are in Peru. Becky was home by herself when the house was broken into, and she was stabbed. She died. She died. A missionary doing God's will in a mission, in, in, a, in a place where she was called to be a missionary, working with women who were being trafficked and everything else. And they believe the person that killed him is somebody that she knows. Somebody that knew her. Somebody that was involved in that ministry somehow. And they're they're trying to figure out who it was. But Bob walked in and found his wife dead in the backyard of his house. One day it was great, the next day tragedy. He fell off the bike. Who won in that scenario, right? Praise the Lord, there's godly people surrounding him right now. And and uh, in the next days and weeks ahead here, we'll find out what's going on. But pray for them. Pray for Colton. Pray for Bob Bass. Um, they worked with Isaiah and Rosanna. They worked with uh, the missionaries in Cusco that we support. The, 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 these are, these are, this is real time stuff going on. Missionary died doing the work of the ministry. Now that could be a tragedy, and it is a tragedy, human human wise, flesh wise. But you know what? Salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you what? I bet you if Becky could come back from heaven, she'd do it again. She'd do it again. She'd go to Peru. She'd do what God called her to do. And she suffered well for Jesus Christ. Daily we face temptations. Daily we have a call to discipleship. So far, we've fleshed out three of the four parts of of this study, this call to discipleship from Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And I I just want to recap these real quick. The word desire there is anyone, if anyone, if there's a desire, if you desire to follow Christ, there needs to be a desire. First, a person must desire to be a disciple. Number two, then there's a denial. Let him deny himself. We covered these. I'm not really going to build on them this morning. Number three, there's a death that takes place. Take up your cross daily. This is your cross, not his cross. You take up your cross. Becky took up her cross every day. And Becky died on her cross following Jesus Christ, her instrument of torture. And two weeks ago, we focused on this third condition of death, and we talked about it in detail. So again, I'm not going to dive into it. But I do want to stop here with point number four, and that is this. There has to be a devotion to Christ. One thing that anybody who knew Becky Bass 
Any, anybody that knew her knew this one thing. She was sold out to God. She was sold out to the mission. She was sold out to her husband. She was sold out to serving Jesus Christ, regardless of what, what happened. And it says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Let's look at this final condition quickly this morning. <coughs> Remember, we defined a disciple as one who follows Jesus no matter what. A disciple is one who follows Jesus no matter what. Follow me is all Jesus had to tell Matthew, right? He walked up to Matthew and said what? Follow me. That's it. To others, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, right? So a disciple is one who follows Jesus no matter what. After, desi after desire, after denying, after dying to self, there's one condition, follow me. While the demands of discipleship might be difficult, the key is to focus on one word, me. Follow me. To follow literally means to walk in the same road with. Remember when the two guys were walking with Jesus Christ on the road to Emmaus? They followed him. He was walking alongside the same road as they were walking. And they said, did not our heart burn within us as we walked in the way? When we consider the invincibility of Christ and his irresistible call on our lives, we'll want to desire our desires to line up with his desires and we'll gladly deny ourselves. We'll gladly and joyfully take up our cross daily and we'll be intent on following him. We'll be intent. You ever watch somebody try to walk in the footprints of somebody else in the snow and their strides a little bigger than the other person's and they're kind of like, like right? Follow me. Intentionality of hitting the footsteps of the person in front of you. Follow me. We begin with the word me because we need to know who is calling for us to know who to follow. You see, we're not following a pastor. We're not following a denomination. We're not following a church. We're not following somebody else. We're following Christ. Christ. Paul said it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. So if you're going to follow somebody, make sure the person you're following is following the one who's worthy to be followed. That way, at least you're walking in the right direction. What happens if the person in front of you strays and falls in the ditch, falls off his bike? Are you going to get piled up in behind him? Or are you going to keep walking and following Christ? We fixate our eyes on the prize for the high calling of Jesus Christ. In Revelation alone, we find over 35 names and titles of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? In Revelation alone, you'll find 35 names or titles of Jesus Christ. Let me give you some of them real quick. Listen to this. These are just from the first 10 chapters. All right? Chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus Christ. 1, 5, faithful witness. 1, 5, firstborn of the dead. 1, 5, ruler of the kings of the earth. 1, 8, the Alpha and Omega. The one who is, the one who was, the one who is to come. 1.8, the Almighty, 1.8, Son of Man, 1.13, First and Last, 1.17, the Living One Who Died, 1.18, and I could just keep going. That was chapter one, by the way. I didn't even give you any of the other chapters. When Jesus calls us to follow him, we must know the one who's worthy to be followed. We need to know who's speaking. We need to know what he's like. We need to know that he's worthy of all glory. He's worthy of our total abandonment and our total surrender. And we can trust him and he is worthy to follow. The word follow literally means to walk the same road with. He's worthy to walk with. Jesus said, follow me. It's an invitation. Join me on my path. Join me on my journey. There's a personal aspect when Jesus said this, follow me. It's all about relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about religion. Religion is always man's way of trying to work his way to God. Relationship is God coming down to us, wanting a relationship with us individually. Discipleship is a relationship where we're invited to be close to God, obey his teachings, to walk the same path he walks, and to walk the same road that he walks. By the way, in Old Testament, it was not common for that to be the case. 
In the Old Testament, it was not common for a rabbi to call his people to follow him. Rather, pupils or followers of a rabbi would ask if they could hang out with the rabbi in the hopes that as they hung out with them, that their wisdom and their ways would work out into their life. Jesus comes along and says, I like your rabbi system. It's cute and everything, but I've got something better. Come with me. Rather than you having to ask me if you can be part of my life, I'm inviting you to be part of my life, part of my way and part of my journey. That's what disciples did without hesitation. They followed and hung out with the other people that they desired to have a relationship. Jesus never came up to anyone and said this, accept me, validate me. He never said that. He walked up to people and said what? Follow me. Follow me. The words we use are important. While there's nothing wrong with saying things like, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I'm a Baptist. I really think the correct thing for us to say is, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a follower of Christ. If somebody's a follower of Christ, then there is an objective person that they're following. Who is it? Christ. If you say I'm a Baptist, then who are you following? If you say I'm a Christian, who are you following? If you say I'm a follower of Christ, who are you following? Singular focus. Let me give you some verses. <laughs> I'm going to give you a bunch of them here. So if you want these, go back and watch the live stream. You'll, you'll be able to pull them off. But I'm just going to list these because I don't have time not to. But look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 19 through 22. It said this, and he said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, and the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them immediately. They left the boat their father and their father, and they followed him. They joined his journey. They walked where he walked. Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus passed out from there, passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth and he said to him, follow me. And he arose and what? Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Then the young man heard this and went away sorrowful for he had what? Couldn't do it. Couldn't give it up. Matthew 19 verses 27 and 28. Then Peter said in reply, see what have, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you in the new world, when the son of man will sit on the glorious throne, you will have followed me and will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Mark 6 and verse 1, he went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples what? His disciples what? Are you following? Mark 10, 32, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed at those who followed. And those who followed were afraid and taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was about to happen. Luke 5, 11, and when he... And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and what? Luke 9, 57 to 62, as they were going along the road, someone said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds, have, uh, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. And he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as you go, Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. John 1, 35 through 37. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, behold, the lamb of God. Two disciples heard him say this and they what? John 1, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, found Philip and said to him, what? This captures the first half of the definition of what a disciple is. A disciple is a believer who lovingly follows Jesus. They lovingly follow Jesus. Why? Because he asked them to. 
Let's keep going. John 1, 45 and 46, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, what? Come and see. Philip followed, then intentionally helped Nathanael to follow, which brings me to the second half of our definition of a disciple. And then he intentionally helps others to follow him. So the definition, a disciple is a believer who lovingly follows Jesus and intentionally helps others to follow him. So I ask you the question this morning, who are you discipling? Who are you discipling then? If you're ready to be discipled or sense God calling you to disciple others, then show up on Wednesday night, start a discipleship class at 6.45 p.m. here at Faith. We have opportunity for you to learn. If you want to go disciple somebody, then the best thing you can do is go talk to somebody. What did Nathaniel do? He ran and told. He invited others to come see. Let's jump back in the narrative of what the Bible's talking about when it says, follow me. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they... John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. John 21, 15 to 22, when they finished breakfast, Jesus said, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. And he said a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, you know, Lord, I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. And he said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he said the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said what? Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say unto you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after that saying, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had leaned against the back during the supper. And he said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said, Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said, if it is my will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You what? So a disciple is one who follows Jesus no matter what. Jesus didn't have put, put definers on follow me. People knew when he said, follow me, he knew what it meant. And if you're here today and you're saved, you're a follower of Christ, then you know exactly what follow me means for you. You know exactly what it means. Let a man count his cost, take up his cross daily, and what? Follow me. After the call to discipleship, there are four conditions listed in Luke 9.23. There's the desire, denial, death, and devotion. And Jesus concludes then in the verses 24 through 26 with three cautions. And I'm just going to leave you with these. Caution number one, if you only focus on your own life, you will lose it. If you only focus on your own life, you will lose your life. That's caution number one. Luke 9, 24, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but ever, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. If you try to hold on to what you have, you'll miss what Jesus wants to give you. A person who seeks to be saved, to save his own life by not denying himself in the short run will absolutely lose their life in the end. We would all do well to adopt the Apostle Paul's purpose statement. Acts chapter 20, verse 24, it says this. But I do not account my life of any value or precious to myself. If only I may finish the course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. C.S. Lewis said this. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time. I don't want so much of your money. I don't want so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment the natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are of any good. I will give you new, a new self instead. In fact, I give to you myself, 
my own will shall become yours. I think that kind of summarizes it pretty well. Caution or warning number two. If you only lock into your own successes, you will lose your soul. Caution number two. If you only lock into your own successes, you'll lose your own soul. Jesus is using economic terms here, of profit, gain, loss, and forfeit. Listen to what Luke 9.25 says. For what does a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? What's he gain if he declares bankruptcy? Here's a question to ponder. Will I spend my life for the Savior or will I spend it on wasting myself in this world? The only two options on the shelf, choosing God or choosing Where do you find your validation for life? The world, the flesh, or Jesus Christ? If you're ashamed of Christ, here's warning number three. If you're ashamed of Christ, he'll be ashamed of you. Luke 9, 26, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Remember, we read that together to start the service. So let's not shrink back from the Savior or worry about the words as we live in an adulterous and sinful generation. Don't bail on the one who says, I'll never fail you. I'll never leave you. And it's time for the church to be the church, to be bold in our witness, loving in our terms, loving in our gospel presentation and doing what God wants us to do. And why do we do what we do? We do what we do because of I'm not convinced. The we do what we do because of? If God be not raised, your labor is in vain. But if God be raised, then what? You have the power of God that brings salvation to every man, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The real question is, will you follow him? He said, follow me. Gave you a plethora of verses. So here's the question, what are you going to do with it? I can't do anything with it for you. You have to do it. It's yours to follow him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the opportunity to open it and to to share it today. And Father, the question's real this morning. What are we going to do? What are we going to do after hearing what we've heard today? So many of us start the Christian life like all those riders at the top of that hill. And man, how fun is this going to be to win this race? And before we even hit turn one, we've already wrecked out. And we can sit there and we can wallow in the past, or we can get back on the bike. We can sit there and, and complain and cry about what happened, or we can, we can get up off the ground like God told Joshua to do. And we can pick up our bike and we can get back on the bike and ride the bike like Moses did, like Jonah did, like Gideon did. And yes, even even Joshua eventually got back up on his bike and he rode his bike. And Father, I just pray this morning that there's some here that are struggling, Lord, as we sing these songs. Maybe they kneel down where they are, they sit where they are, they come forward and kneel at the the front. Whatever, Father, the, the motion doesn't matter. It's what's in the heart that matters. And God, you don't look on the outward appearance, you look on the heart. And Father, some of us have wrecked out of the race and we need to get back in. Some of us are just doing things and checking boxes. And Father, we need to realize there is a cause. I love what David said when Goliath was standing there. Is there not a cause? Who is this giant? He's nothing in front of my God. And Father, I pray that today that you would raise us back up and help us see the potential that is out there. If we walk in your will and the power of your might, Father, there's nothing that we can't do where we can get back up on the bike and do it for your glory. So Father, help us to put the excuses away. Help us to stop pretending and playing and help us to get in the fight of the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life and do the work of the ministry to the glory of you. So Father, during this song, I pray that you work in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives to change us and make us what you want us to be. Servants of you, willing to die, following you. 
In your name we pray. All God's people said.